discussion. It's a pleasure to be here. So thank you very much for such an opportunity to present my research. And I will be talking about numerical modeling using graphical processing units. Uh, and I will show you several applications. So first, I will share you, I will share with you some basic information about uh, graphical processing units or GPUs. And then I will show you a few applications. Uh, it includes wave propagation, strain localization, and earthquake nucleation. Well, in principle, uh, the techniques and the methods uh, I'll show you today can be applied to model the physics at different scales. It can be uh, the scale of the Earth, so it, it's, we can call it geodynamics. And the same methods can be used to model the physics at the pore scale. Uh, the main uh, motivation of my work is uh, so-called induced seismicity. Uh, there are many examples. Uh, for, for example, Basel, uh, there are earthquakes due to fluid injection. And what's the most uh, interesting that a major earthquake took place after they stopped uh, injecting the fluid. So we need uh, models uh, to predict and to avoid such uh, earthquakes. Another example is the Groningen gas field. Uh, there are earthquakes due to uh, gas production. And another example is uh, Oklahoma. There are earthquakes due to hydraulic fraction and gas production. So we all need uh, high resolution uh, models to uh, explain the physics of these uh, events. So first I start with uh, uh, some general information about graphical processing units. If you are interested in more details, please uh, have a look. Uh, there are two papers recently published in GGR Solid Earth and Geophysical Journal International. And um, here is the modeling workflow. It's quite standard for uh, in general. So first we consider certain medium, it can be elastic. And then we would like to model seismic response. So for that, we need wave equation. Then we discretize the medium, use particular solver, and visualize the results and interpret the results. So the main features of my research are the following. There are new models to describe the physics, and I rely on the latest uh, hardware architecture such as uh, GPUs. So this is actually a very important slide. It shows you the hardware evolution. So the x-axis corresponds to years from 90s till uh, today. And you can see uh, there is a borderline in 2005. So before 2005, um, computational speed was determined by floating point operations. But after 2005, memory speed started to determine performance. In other words, during the calculation, reading and writing information from a disk is the most time consuming operation. And all calculations are completely free. And that's why GPUs can be uh, quite powerful. So here is the conceptual representation of a CPU. There are four cores, each core is quite powerful. And on the right, you can see a conceptual representation of a GPU. There are many little CPUs or threads, and we can execute these threads simultaneously. And each thread can read and try certain information on a disk and do some basic calculations. And so you can compare the number of little CPUs on a GPU uh, and uh, Usually, the performance gain is about two orders of magnitude between CPU and GPU. Uh, I uh, use quite simple numerical method. We can call it uh, finite volumes with rectangular grids or uh, conservative uh, finite differences. Um, the uh, pressure and stress uh, field uh, position is in the center of our basic uh, volume and velocities are uh, at the walls or boundaries of our uh, domain. And it makes uh, this uh, steam uh, conservative. And uh, as example, I'm showing the wave equation. There are 
two equations, two unknowns, pressure and velocity. And um, basically in order to solve the wave equation, we need some integrate in time. And also there are some spatial derivatives. And here's the simple uh, one dimensional representation of such a code. So if it is not vectorized, we have a time loop uh, to integrate in time. And also we have a for loop uh, to uh, update pressure and velocities at all spatial positions. So if our code is vectorized, we can avoid this additional for loop and write just these two lines. So the most important that there are two for loops. One is to integrate in time and oh. another one to update all spatial locations. And here's actually the difference between uh, C, MATLAB, and uh, CUDA C. So I use a C extension of C language to execute codes on a GPU. It's called CUDA C. And uh, you can see that the pressure update is essentially the same in C, in MATLAB, and in uh, C CUDA, which is GPU. The only difference that on a C or MATLAB, we sequentially update uh, pressure at all spatial locations. But on a GPU, we can replace this for loop by something else, meaning that we can execute and update pressure simultaneously. So because there are many little CPUs, we simply update uh, all pressure simultaneously instead of sequentially going uh, through spatial domain uh, using CPU. So that's the main difference. I, th I think this is actually the most important part of the presentation. And that's exactly where we gain performance by uh, avoiding for loop and taking advantage of thousands of little CPUs to accelerate our code. So why it is possible? Because uh, it is local operation in space. So we can read certain information, write certain information, and update in a particular grid point. Uh, and all our like thousands of little CPUs on a GPU can do this operation. Good question? Yes. You have IX plus I and IX at the bottom. So those two are related to each other. So how do they get done in parallel? Um, so can you can you repeat the you have IX plus one via BX and IX is the index on B. Doing that difference. So the thing happening at IX plus one depends on what happens at IX. So in a standard loop, you can see how to do that, but if you're doing that all simultaneously, it's not obvious. No, nope, because the P has to be changing. No, we, no it's only P. Oh, okay. well, only P is changing, so VX is already written on the disk. So we, can, we, we just read the information. And another advantage of uh, GPU uh, that uh, just imagine a large domain. So what we can do, we can partition our large domain into several subdomains. So here you can see four subdomains. And um, in order to uh, integrate our equation, uh, we have to exchange boundary points between subdomain at each time step. For that, what we can do, we can first calculate domain one, which is in yellow, and uh, like each GPU first calculates domain one, then we calculate domain two, and at the same time, we exchange boundary points between GPUs. So each GPU uh, is used to calculate its particular domain, and because we partition our subdomains into two parts, we can hide MPI communication. Um, because uh, GPU, it's called streams, uh, we can uh, do several operations in parallel. So we can update our subdomain and we can exchange boundary points between GPUs. And here you can see uh, the performance test. It's a weak scaling test. Uh, the X axis corresponds to the number of GPUs. Uh, so uh, there are 128 GPUs, and you can see that the parallel efficiency is about 98%, 96%, or so 100%. So in other words, uh, if you have 10 GPUs, your calculation is 10 times faster. 
Now, uh, I would like to show you several uh, applications. And the first application is related to wave propagation. To begin with, uh, I would like to uh, ask uh, the following question. So imagine a cube of one billion grid cells. It's thousand by thousand by thousand. And we would like to uh, calculate the reflection data. So for that, we have a source on top, wave propagate downwards, then reflects and propagate upwards, and we record it using a receiver. So the question is, can we calculate reflection data in less than a minute? And here you can see acoustic media, elastic media, and poor elastic media, like three different scenarios and two different GPU architectures. And now you can guess, but I already can give you the answer that yes, using the latest hardware architectures, we can actually go to 20 seconds if the medium is just acoustic or it is, if it is poor elastic, so the physics is rich, it can be one minute. So it just gives you an idea how fast it can be. Now let's talk about poor elasticity. Uh, it's a hydromechanically coupled medium or uh, porous medium. So in, in addition to uh, elastic moduli, like bulk and shear modulus of the rock, we need also porosity, uh, permeability, and fluid viscosity to describe the physics. And that's quite very well established theory of pore elasticity. It's known for, uh, I think, for, for 70 years already. Uh, so here is a, a typical response of such a medium. But first, let's look at the equation. There are five equations and five unknowns. Uh, total pressure, fluid pressure, stress deviator, uh, solid velocity and Darcy flux. And what's the most uh, important that uh, total pressure and fluid pressure are coupled via Biovillis coefficient. And um, in the momentum equation, you can see coupling through added mass coefficients represented by solid, uh, by fluid density. And here on the right, you can see a, a typical response of such a medium. There are two propagating waves, fast wave, and propagating slow wave. But if we, question. yep. Uh, how do you solve those simultaneous questions? How can I, how do, how do you solve those simultaneous questions? The same method as you Yeah, the, 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 the same, like, um, uh, conservative final differences. So the, the, the same method. But if you want to know more details, we can talk afterwards. So oh, I can give you more. Yes, 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 we are linear. Oh. And uh, here is uh, another response of such a poor elastic medium. So if we change permeability or viscosity of the uh, permeability of the medium or viscosity of the fluid, we still can observe fast wave but slow wave behaves as a diffusion process. So instead of fast propagating wave, we have uh, Darcy and flow. It's a fluid flow in porous media. And you can think about it as a viscous honey. So under room temperature, it spreads over time like a Gaussian. So that's how fluid flow takes place in uh, porous media. Uh, our numerical solutions uh, have been validated against an analytical solution. You can see the comparison is quite good. And also there are convergence tests. So I'm not going into details, but I just want to confirm that uh, we validated uh, our, uh, we kind of performed all numerical tests to make sure that our solution is consistent and uh, is correct. Uh, here is a 2D example, uh, a typical response of an isotropic sandstorm. So if our medium is acoustic, we can observe just a uh, fast wave. If our medium is uh, elastic, in addition to fast wave, you can observe shear wave. And if uh, our medium is poor elastic and uh, the frequencies are quite high, we can observe 
fast wave, shear wave, and also slow BO wave. Uh, if uh, our medium is anisotropic, for example, here you can see a VTI. Uh, it corresponds to layered medium, like on the Earth. Uh, the response is much more complex. You can see that at high frequencies, uh, there are fast wave, uh, shear wave, and also slow wave. There are some uh, complex uh, wave patterns. Um, can be seen, and if the frequency is low, the slow wave is attenuated and we cannot see it uh, anymore. Now uh, you can see essentially the same simulations, but uh, using uh, three dimensional, uh, uh, it's three dimensional uh, models. So the, uh, it's, uh, it corresponds to an isotropic response. And on the right, you can see an isotropic response of a sandstorm. So now I would like to show you this short movie. And now I explain what happens. Uh, we set initial condition to fluid injection into the center of the model. And it resulted into propagating waves and also fluid pressure diffusion in the middle. Uh, and uh, the resolution is 1,000 cube. So it responds to 1 billion grid cells. Uh, and it took us just 35 seconds uh, on uh, eight uh, Tesla uh, B100 GPUs. So again, you can see that we can model uh, quite uh, realistic scenarios using GPUs. Now uh, you can ask, uh, okay, you showed some modeling studies, but what about the real application? And here is uh, the uh, seismic waveform modeling of an earthquake, uh, which took place in Switzerland a few years ago. Uh, the source is in the middle and it's quite complex uh, moment tensor source, which corresponds to a particular earthquake. And here you can see the actual simulation. Uh, there are, fast waves, also shear waves, and also you can see surface waves. Uh, the amplitude is very high and the amplitude uh, is decaying uh, with depths. You can uh, see that uh, there are uh, absorbing boundary conditions and free surface boundary conditions on top. So this scenario is quite realistic and we validated it using a different numerical method uh, to make sure that uh, our simulation is uh, correct. Uh, now, uh, I showed you uh, basically simulations using a professional GPU, but what if you don't have such a GPU, you have just a gaming laptop <clears throat> and you still can do a lot of things. So here you can see a, a simulation of wave propagation in poor elastic media. The resolution is 500 uh, cube. So it's actually more than 100 uh, million grid cells. And you can do it using, G, uh, using a laptop GPU in less than a minute. So it takes just uh, 50 seconds to obtain, to, to get such a response. Uh, also using uh, GPUs, we can visualize uh, nicely uh, our results. So we can interpret the nucleation of our wave and how it propagates uh, with time. And we can look at different angles. So it also helps to understand the physics, not only to analyze the final result. And uh, here, for example, uh, you can see a final snapshot of uh, velocity field in the poor elastic media. So you see red uh, and blue domains representing positive and negative uh, velocity components. And also in the middle, uh, you can see in, in the middle propagating slow wave. So to summarize uh, this part, uh, I have shown that uh, using professional GPUs and uh, also laptop GPU, we can do a lot of things and we can model um, uh, waves in complex media and uh, the media can be also heterogeneous. Now uh, let's move on to uh, another application uh, and I will show you a few modeling studies related to strain localization. 
so the motivation is again to model and use seismicity and the general framework is the following uh, in order to model and use seismicity we should be able to model slow quasi-static loading of the medium then uh, fluid injection and once we reach certain threshold and first wave occurred we need wave propagation solver to model the wave propagation and this uh, motivated me to construct a unified solver which can uh, capture all these processes simultaneously to begin with i start uh, with quite a simple experiment uh, here you can see a rock sample and uh, uh, this is a simplified model with inclusion weak inclusion in the middle and we apply pure shear boundary conditions so we compress our sample on top and we apply ex exchanging uh, extension in a horizontal uh, axis and uh, before i show you the actual simulation let's talk about the physics how we can model it so first we need certain rheology uh, of the medium so i have codes for elastoplastic viscoplastic poor elastoplastic rheologists also we know that rocks exhibit different behavior under volumetric deformation and deviatoric deformation, like shear deformation. And we can also take it into account by using different geologies for volumetric and shear uh, relaxation for shear deformation. And regarding plasticity, it's implemented using a non-associated uh, pressure-dependent rucker prager model. So the general framework is the following. We have a rock sample we mm, apply some loading strain increments and as a result stress is increasing in our rock at certain points stress reaches certain threshold and then the material or the rock is starting to yield and strain localization occurs so in metals we have just one parameter cohesion so once stress reaches certain threshold uh, metals uh, started to yield but in rocks uh, this stiffness is uh, pressure dependent. So in addition to cohesion, we also need angle of internal friction and pressure to model such a behavior. But if our medium is porous, then instead of uh, the total pressure, we rely on the effective pressure, which is the difference between total and fluid pressure. So fluids can also significantly affect uh, the failure of the rock. Now let's talk a bit about mathematics and the, uh, the equations uh, we are solving. Uh, I'm, I'm showing just a simple uh, single phase example. You can see the standard momentum equation. You can see constitutive equations and the uh, strain rate is decomposed into four parts. Uh, the first two components represent elastic volumetric and elastic deviatoric uh, deformation uh, the second uh, the third component represents uh, viscose part and the last component represents plasticity and uh, i use the same numerical method i showed you before to solve the system of equations but what the most important uh, on the left, you can see the equations I would like to solve, but on the right, you can see equations which I actually solved. So here you can see that this is quasi static equation. And I use relaxation method by adding pseudo time derivative uh, on into the right hand side and uh, with certain attenuation parameter, and I wait till uh, the uh, derivative uh, attenuated and we reach quasi-static solution. In other words, to solve quasi-static equations, I use uh, the same dynamic equations and wait till they attenuate to reach quasi-static solution. And it um, allow me to, allows me to uh, resolve quite uh, large domains. I will show you uh, later on. Uh, another important parameter is to actually find the best dumping in this relaxation method and generally speaking uh, a wave uh, 
is traveling 10 times in our domain before it reaches uh, uh, 10 to the power minus 12, so it reaches zero. So um, our method is uh, like the performance is proportional to the number of uh, cells in uh, X dimension. Uh, now, finally, let's uh, uh, do this experiment, uh, pure shear uh, for this simple example. And here you can see uh, the total pressure field. Uh, you can see the evolution of strain localization and the development of shear bands. Uh, on the right, you can see the integrated stress over one vertical segment. So we took one vertical segment and integrated the stress. So again, what's the physics? We uh, apply small loading increments in strain. Uh, which you can see here because the stress is increasing in the rock. Then at certain point, we reach certain threshold and this threshold is pressure dependent and the material uh, is starting to yield. Strain localization occurs uh, and it results in the development of shear bands. So if you think of a fault, that's actually what's happening. Uh, but this is a simplified example how we can develop a realistic fault uh, and how we can take into account heterogeneous stress field around the fault and inside the fault. For example, you can see that the pressure field uh, is completely different inside the strain localization and in the surrounding domain. So it's important to um, actually model the uh, evolution of the strain localization to take into account uh, heterogeneous initial uh, conditions. Now uh, let's talk about uh, rheology. So if we have elastoplastic or viscoplastic rheology, what's the difference? And you can see that there are uh, simulations on top uh, corresponding to uh, elastoplastic rheology and on the bottom corresponding to viscoplastic rheology. And you can see that the pattern is quite similar. The only difference is how we load the medium. If the medium is elastic, we need strain increments uh, to increase stress, uh, to increase integrated stress in the rock. But if the medium is viscoelastic, we need velocity increments uh, and we can achieve the same strain localization pattern. Now let's talk about symmetry versus non-symmetry. In the middle, you can see the uh, invariant of the strain uh, uh, tensor. Uh, so uh, actually, it's uh, you, you can see this strain localization pattern. And if uh, the simulation is not uh, converged, then it is symmetric. But if the simulation is fully converged and resolved, the pattern is non symmetric. So the general solution of strain localization is no linear problem, and the solution is non symmetric. And uh, how we can uh, see this? Uh, we apply loading increments in time to achieve uh, high stresses in the rock. And if our increments is uh, large, which corresponds to the symmetric solution, we simply miss uh, stress drop because if our loading increments are very small, then when uh, mm -hmm shear band reaches uh, the uh, boundaries of our domain, we immediately can see stress drop and it can be, for example, I think repeated in a, in a laboratory. So if uh, we, the result is that we need high temporal resolution to resolve the stress drops in the, uh, during the simulation. Now let's talk about, uh, Spatial resolution. So here you can see a numerical simulation. Yep. Quick question. So this is this simulation is strain control. Um, so I apply strain increments, and uh, yes, it's strain controlled, and there are free sleep boundary conditions. Uh, so here is the example of. Uh, um, quite high resolution simulation of 10,000 by 10,000. So it corresponds to more than uh, one 
hundred million grid cells. And uh, um, what I would like to emphasize here that if you use finite element methods, for example, in, implicit solver, you are restricted to several million elements, like one million, five million, or say maximum 20 millions. But using our relaxation method, we can solve quasi-static problem uh, in much larger domains, uh, corresponding to 100 million or 1 billion, as I showed you before. So what does it mean 10,000 by 10,000? Here you can see a combination of 50 full HD screens, so like my screen. And if we combine the resolution of all 50 uh, full HD screens, we end up with the same uh, resolution as in our numerical simulation. So let's look at the physics of what we can achieve using such high resolution. So let's zoom in. And now you can see the strain localization pattern. It's non-symmetric, so it's correct. Yep. I'm curious why the strain localization is always going up to the upper left. Why doesn't it go in the other direction occasionally? Occasionally, it can go into any direction, like left or right. So we cannot predict it. Is some randomness in the yes. way you set this up to get it going? Yeah. Uh, so um, here you can see the strain localization. Uh, and mm, let's further zoom in, uh, like here. And now what you can see that the shear band is growing under two different angles, actually. And this is quite important. Uh, for example, there are some publications by Vermeer uh, and Vordalak is um, trying to establish uh, what is the right angle for, for strain localization. And if we think of uh, geodynamics, if we have a realistic fault, there is always certain angle. And it's important to understand um, why the angle is like well, why there is a particular angle. And let's further in zoom in. And now you can see that actually when we when the strain localization is growing and the angle is changing, we, we can see some uh, strain, uh, some stress concentrators. So it's also something new, a new particular feature that we can observe stress concentrators in such a model. So it gives you an idea uh, that using high spatial and high temporal resolution, we can um, uh, understand the physics much better. Uh, I also repeated the same simulations in three dimensions. The resolution is 500 uh, uh, cube. So the total resolution is, what, is more than 100 uh, million grid cells. So it's impossible to do it using an, another solver because we cannot solve a system of linear equations for like 1 billion or 100 million um, elements. Uh, and uh, because I use a relaxation method, we can achieve such high resolution. And also you can see the stress drops corresponding to the numerical uh, to this numerical simulation and if again our resolution is low uh, for example there are large strain uh, strain increments in time and the spatial resolution is low we end up with uh, not accurate symmetric uh, solution so even the angle at which uh, strain localization is growing is uh, incorrect and here you can see the video of such uh, uh, strain evolution. And there are particular boundary conditions where uh, the strain localization cannot reach the uh, boundaries of the model. And uh, if we change the boundary conditions to free sleep, then actually strain localization can reflect from the boundaries, uh, like in two-dimensional example I showed you before. So the resolution is uh, 500 uh, cube, uh, it's very high. Uh, and uh, um, I'm actually uh, happy to share with you such nice uh, results. So you uh, said that the boundary conditions on that example are free slip? Yep. Okay. And uh, again, because we are using GPUs, we can uh, visualize uh, and interpret our results nicely. Uh, so we can uh, see uh, the evolution and the initial nucleation of uh, 
the screen localization. So here is just the final snapshot, and I'm just rotating it and uh, uh, trying to see some particular features. And now let's move on to part four. This is the last part. It's uh, I will be talking about earthquake nucleation. There are some preliminary results, uh, but uh, I think they are quite important to share. Now let's look again at this example where we apply strain increments and strain localization occurs. And on the right, you can see the integrated stress in the uh, vertical segment of the rock sample. And now I would like to emphasize your attention onto the stress drops because each stress drop can be interpreted as a particular earthquake. So that's kind of a, another interpretation of uh, this figure on the right. And what we can do actually, uh, uh, each stress drop corresponds to a particular local evolution of uh, uh, strain uh, increments. And we can use such strain increments as initial condition uh, to start wave propagation. And now you can see that there are many stress drops and each stress drop corresponds to earthquake nucleation um, using the, 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 this approach I just explained to you. So in other words, we can model simultaneously slow quasi-static loading. And once there is a stress drop, we immediately uh, start earthquake nucleation and it is in the one framework of one solver. Uh, now, I would like to show you a bit better simulation. It's high resolution simulation of more than 2,000 increments. The resolution is 1,000 by 1,000. You can see many stress drops. There are few major stress drops and also many little stress drops. And uh, the, uh, like B, C, and D corresponds to these uh, panels uh, where you can see the evolution of uh, shear bands. And for just a particular example, uh, let's consider this uh, strain localization, which is quite small, and it corresponds to the evolution of, uh, to, to certain evolution of uh, uh, the strains, which we use as initial condition to the wave propagation solver. And now you can see propagating wave after um, 250 time steps. So this general framework, uh, allow us to uh, model uh, slow quasi-static loading and uh, earthquake nucleation. And also uh, recently I uh, extended this framework to model fluid injection. So we can, for example, load the medium, develop uh, strain localization, so develop fault. Then we can apply viscosity to unload the medium. Then we can inject fluid into uh, the rock and uh, faults are activating and uh, the we can see resulting wave propagation. So this gives you a general framework uh, where it's going on and I hope to show you some three-dimensional results soon. And uh, of course I repeated it in three dimensions so you can see three-dimensional simulation as I showed you before. There are major stress drops and also small stress drops. The resolution is uh, again quite high. 500 cube uh, corresponding to more than 100 uh, billion uh, grid uh, cells. It looks like that's slow events, right? You have the stress drops, but there's some stress drops which seem to occur at a very slow pace. The one next to that, the one to the right, in the other direction. Right. Right. This, this, this one. This one? This one? Yeah. What's happening in there? <laughs> Uh, well, it's called interseismic period, so I wouldn't call it a because stress drops are sharp. So it's simultaneous, like we develop um, shear band simultaneously. But here is just slow development and it's not resulting into certain wave propagation. Actually, when it's being plotted on the y axis, I can't actually read it. It is integrated stress. So we take one. Uh, plane and integrate stress in the plane and uh, x-axis corresponds to increments in strain or, or time because we apply uh, like we uh, using non-dimensional analysis we link strain increments with time uh, so 
I'm just trying to work out whether that corresponds to something like what we call slow slip events that actually we see in fault zones. Yeah, more, more most likely, but we, 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 this is something uh, new, and I didn't have chance to interpret it nicely. So I have to work a bit more to uh, interpret it in a, uh, like to have some rich interpretation of these results. And uh, now uh, I would like to end up, and there are conclusions. So I showed you uh, some applications uh, related to wave propagation. So it's fully coupled physics, uh, hydromechanical coupling. I also showed you that uh, uh, high spatial and temporal resolution is important. Uh, also, um, simulations I showed you today, um, like I, I spent just seconds or minutes, even in 3D, to calculate these results, and I simultaneously model quasi static and dynamic response. So there are a few take home points that uh, uh, modeling of uh, full physics is important, so coupled physical processes. And it's also, in my opinion, important to use the latest hardware accelerators to reach solution in seconds. And we also need a high temporal and spatial resolution to resolve the physics, because if our resolution is uh, uh, not so good, we can miss important events. And uh, the last uh, point I would like to tell you that uh, GPUs are not just uh, fast. Uh, because usually when we do research, we rely on certain analytical models and we can play with input parameters and gain some uh, like user analytics and gain some intuition uh, how the model involves with, uh, depending on input parameters. And that's because analytics is fast, but it is limited. And now we can actually replace the analytical solution by the numerical solution because if I click and in three seconds I reach the result, I can play with the input parameters and I can gain the same uh, understanding, but using much more complex uh, physics, full physics, coupled physics. And uh, also the targeting problems become different. They be, are more complex. So with this note, I would like to conclude. And the main message that it's not just fast, it changes the way you do research. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions in the in the room here?